ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. As Sir Mo Farah has revealed, he was trafficked from his home in East Africa to the UK at the age of just nine years old and forced to work as a domestic servant. We're taking a look at the realities of trafficking today and the process of getting help. Samo explains in his BBC documentary how he was given the name Mohammed Farah instead of his real name, Hussein Abdi Kahin, and forced to look after young children. He revealed how he confided in his PE teacher about his situation and was eventually given a new home with a Somali family when he was in secondary school. The government can legally remove a person's British citizenship if it was obtained through fraud, but it's understood the Home Office won't take any action against Mo. His story has prompted criticism of the government's proposed Rwanda immigration policy and calls for more action to stop traffickers. So to discuss the current situation facing those who are trafficked into the UK, Social worker Lauren Starkey from anti-trafficking charity Love146 joins me now. So Lauren, first of all, what was your reaction to Mo Farah's story? I think it's incredibly brave of him to open up and share this. I think particularly in a climate where victims of trafficking are being increasingly disbelieved, I think for him to come out and say, this is what happened to me, you know, and and to serve as an example that it's obviously he's not the only person this has ever happened to. You know, we we have known over the years this happens to thousands of young people. And so I think we're in we're in a really toxic culture at the moment around people coming forward as victims of trafficking. So I think for him to share his story now is really brave. And I think it also opens up a lot to thinking about this issue more broadly and how we respond to victims of trafficking, how we conceptualise what trafficking is, what it means for children and young people, and what their futures can look like. Because I think he's a great example of someone who overcame that experience and has had an extraordinary life. And he's an example of what recovery looks like. And Mo obviously had a lucky escape thanks to his PE teacher, Can you give us an example of what other trafficked children experience and how they find a way out? So trafficking and the exploitation involved in trafficking takes many different forms. So in the sort of the lingo we would use for what happened to Mo Farah is domestic servitude. Um, It's a very, very common form of trafficking in which young people are brought into the UK um, and forced to do household chores often forced to remain in the houses and not allowed to go out. I think in his story, he talked about, you know, for the first two years, he wasn't allowed to go to school. That's really common. Um, There's a lot of childcare that's often involved. And I think for him being able to go to school um, and for teachers to recognise the signs was really, really important. I think in differing forms, you get things like the criminal exploitation. You see a lot of children and young people who are forced to work in cannabis houses. And that's when a residential house is converted into a grow house for cannabis and children are locked inside and forced to work. Often those children are found when police raid the properties, having been tipped off that it's a cannabis farm. That can end in a number of ways. Some children aren't so lucky and are actually prosecuted for drug cultivation and not recognised appropriately as victims. Others are appropriately recognised and taken into care. Some children and young people do manage to run away from their exploiters, but others it takes months, years of a trusted person having their ear and then finally being able to open up. I think that's something we work on really closely is is victims of trafficking aren't always hidden away. They're not always locked in a house working, they're not always locked in a house you know, growing cannabis, you get young people who are working in car washes. A lot of young people, particularly around criminal exploitation, forced into dealing cocaine on the streets you know, labouring on construction sites. And they they might come into contact with lots of different services, in fact, but they might be frightened, they're scared, they don't know who to talk to. So it's the process of creating a safe space, giving them the time that they need to feel safe enough to open up and talk to someone, which is clearly what, what Mo Farah's teachers were able to do for him. And one of the things that's come out today as people have responded to Mo's story online is the Rwanda immigration policy. What do you make of that being brought back into the limelight by Mo's story? 
it's really, really relevant because the Rwanda policy has enormous risks for victims of trafficking. There were people who were due to be on that initial flight that was cancelled at the last minute who had been identified as victims of trafficking. And it's really important to note, for example, people who have a debt bond hanging over them, deporting them to Rwanda doesn't change that fact. What is more than likely going to happen is that once in Rwanda, that person is going to make contact with their traffickers and try and find a way to get out. And what it's doing is really, really heightening the risk of re-trafficking and it's taking them away from the, the safeguards that we have in this country. And there are actually some really, really brilliant steps we have taken as a nation when it comes to protecting victims of trafficking. And the Rwanda policy completely undermines all of those protections. So how do you think this story will affect people's perceptions of undocumented immigrants? Hopefully, what it will do is increase the understanding that people become undocumented for all sorts of reasons. I think there's a a, a general misunderstanding of what it means to be undocumented. And I think Mo's story will hopefully show people that it's much more nuanced and that there is much more complexity to it than they realise. It's not what it's been presented in the press, you know, the the narratives around people sneaking into the country and that kind of thing. It's it's more than that. It's more risky for the, the individual person than that. We hear a lot of talk at the moment about undocumented people and being removed from the country, you know, sent to Rwanda or sent back where they came from or or all different places. But actually Mo Farah is an example of an undocumented person who started out undocumented, who has gone on to be an incredible ambassador for his country. And that is the future that undocumented people can have if they are offered the appropriate support that they need. You know, Just because a person's undocumented doesn't mean they're not clever. It doesn't mean they're not funny. It doesn't mean they're not talented. People come to this country with a huge range of really rich histories and rich stories and talents. But if we don't give them that opportunity, we will never know. Now, Imogen Spencer Campbell, Love 146's Director of Services, joins me to explain the impact of Mo's story. So Imogen, how important is it that such a high profile story such as Mo's is now out there in the open? I think it's incredibly important. I think he may be one of the most high profile figures in this country that is known by everyone from every section, you know, from young to old. I just think it's really important in terms of raising awareness about the issue and about the fact that's happened, because I think it might mean that It's an opportunity for us to raise awareness amongst local communities, amongst schools, amongst health visiting teams, people who are going into into residential homes and who might see a child who doesn't look okay. There might be some signs of a a malnourished child, a child who doesn't perhaps belong within that family unit. And all it takes is for a neighbour or a professional or a teacher to say, I'm not sure something is is right. And and then to remember Mo Farah's story and to think, I wonder whether this could potentially be a case of a child that's been trafficked and then they can contact their local children's services and raise that concern and then it gets and then it will be passed and hopefully followed up. And in your experience what roadblocks are there that stop young children like Mo getting the help they need? One of the issues that young people have spoken to me about over the years is that very often they even once they had the courage to disclose what had happened to them, they weren't always believed by the professionals that they disclosed to. And one young person once told me the most important thing that any professional had ever done for them was to believe them. So I think raising awareness, and this is something that that, that Mo Farah having the courage to come out with, with the stories of his childhood, is that I hope it opens up a door for the country to understand that this is a real thing. It really, really does happen mm-hmm. to, to children as young as nine years old and even younger in some cases. Let's take a break now. In part two, we'll hear from refugee and asylum specialist Louise Calvi who explains why new laws are making life tougher for people who find themselves in a similar situation to Mo Farah. If you don't disclose that you've been the victim of modern slavery within a certain time frame, you'll be penalised. That's shocking. Now, refugee and asylum specialist Louise Calvi joins me now. First of all, Louise, can you give us your reaction to Mo's story? 
my reaction when I saw the story last night was one of uh, just such sadness that he felt that he had to live for the last 30 years as someone entirely different, that he felt he couldn't share his truth. Obviously, his, his experiences must have been utterly horrific at such a young age to be forced into servitude. So not only do you have that horrific trauma of being trafficked, of being removed from your family, placed into a strange country and forced to work, then you have to try and extract yourself from that situation with no support, no real understanding of what trafficking means. It's a very abstract concept. And then to have to hide that for so many years because you're worried about people's response to that, people's reaction to that. That's just awful and, and so heartbreaking. And what bravery and courage it's taken for him now to own his truth at a time in which we're seeing government narrative, government policy around vulnerable migrants, those that are in need of protection in the UK. Right now, all of those principles are under attack by this government. And for Mo to find the courage to speak out now is so beautiful. And I'm so grateful to him for that. And it is an amazing story and it's provoked so much reaction online. You're one of those people who has reacted to it, uh, referencing the many people who are trafficked into the country and then left in limbo when they seek support, in some cases for years, through the national referral mechanism. How big a problem is that? It's a huge problem and it's an increasing problem. We're seeing delays through the national referral mechanism increase significantly year on year. The national referral mechanism is how a person who's been trafficked is formally recognised identified and supported. Initially, referrals into the NRM were very low. They are growing year on year, which is a good sign. We know that trafficking is an extreme problem in the UK. We know that we're not touching the surface of the people that we really need to reach and get into the NRM. The problem comes when decision-making rates aren't matching referral in rates. Just recently, we saw a 20% increase in 2021, into referrals into the NRM from the year preceding. And delays in decision making have increased correspondingly. So we're seeing an average now of around uh, over 400 days to go from a reasonable grounds decision to a conclusive grounds decision. Those are the technical terms. The conclusive grounds decision concludes that that person has been trafficked. So on average, people are waiting well over a year for that decision. That's a year typically where they might not have status in the UK, where they might not have the good support mechanisms in the UK, where they're living in that limbo. And I would say that what Mo's story shines a spotlight on is a, a massive need to be finding people that are the victims and survivors of human trafficking more to be facilitating access to the NRM more speedily and for the Home Office and the government to be processing decisions much more efficiently than they are and the statistics tell us. And Louise, do you think Mo's story will force any changes in the way traffic people are given support? I think that it will force changes at a community level, at a local government level. One of the absolutely beautiful things about Mo's story is that the person that helped him, the person that got him out, was a teacher. It wasn't a police officer, it wasn't a home office caseworker or a decision maker, it wasn't a refugee charity, it was a teacher that helped him. So I think it will help everyone that works in and around young people, vulnerable people and vulnerable migrant communities to be more aware of the indicators and impact of trafficking and servitude and exploitation. And at that level, I think it will raise awareness and that will naturally deliver some change in our detection rates. Will it change government agenda? I think possibly not until we have a fundamental root and branch review of the direction our government is taking. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and at standard.co.uk. 
That's the leader. We're back tomorrow at 4 p.m.